see him occasionally on campus as the kid who interviewed him in Hong Kong. In fact, Professor Nash's area of expertise, game theory, the study of strategic decision making, is also one of my favorite areas in mathematics. And today, I wish to introduce to you a simple but important concept in game theory called the prisoner's dilemma. Suppose two criminals, A and B, are arrested by the police. Each of them is interrogated in isolation, separately, and they cannot communicate with each other. So each of them can choose to testify to the crime, which means admitting, admitting having committed the crime, or he or she can choose to remain silent and say nothing. If both of them testify, each will get 33 years in prison. If one of them testifies and the other remains silent, the one who testifies will be set free, rewarded with freedom, and the one who remains silent will get life imprisonment. If both of them choose to remain silent, each will only get three years in prison. Now, I want to do a little survey of what you would choose to do if you were put in this situation. So, um, how many of you would choose to testify? Please raise your hands. <laughs> okay, I I'm looking for honest girls. So, how many of you would choose to testify? I, I only saw a couple of hands, perhaps less than, fewer than 10. And in that case, how many of you would choose to remain silent? <laughs> okay, you are very clever students. Now, let's take a closer look at the situation from the perspective of one of the prisoners, A, for example. What is A going to think? Well, suppose B testifies. In that case, if A chooses to testify as well, he will get 33 years in prison. But if A chooses to remain silent, he will get life imprisonment. So testifying seems to be the better strategy for A in this case. And what if B remains silent? If A testifies, he will be set free. But if A remains silent, he will get three years. So testifying is still the better strategy for A, in this case, which gives him the better outcome. So in conclusion, we see that testifying will always give A the better outcome, no matter what B does. And what about B? What is B going to think? Well, notice that the situation is symmetric for A and B. So what B is going to think is basically the same as, just, as, as what we just went through for A. So B is also going to find testifying to be his dominant strategy, which always gives him the better outcome no matter what A does. But now, we see something interesting in this situation. If both A and B adopt their dominant strategy, testifying, which is supposed to serve them the best, they will each get 33 years in prison but that is definitely not the best outcome for any one of them. Because if they had remained silent, then each of them would only get three years in prison instead of 33, and each of them would have been better off. Adam Smith claimed that individual efforts to maximize their own gains would eventually benefit society. But this example of prisoner's dilemma shows that the invisible hand sometimes fails. When both prisoners testify and try to get the best outcome for both of them, they end up falling into what is called a Nash equilibrium. Um, this Nash equilibrium is named after Professor John Nash. And both get worse results than they could have gotten by cooperating with each other and both remaining silent. But can they really cooperate? If A remains silent, but imagine what happens when B betrays A by choosing to testify. Then, of course, B will be rewarded with freedom, but that sends A to life imprisonment. 
So that is very risky for A. So this shows that cooperation requires mutual trust. And both parties have to trust each other in order to have the confidence to cooperate. OK, now you may ask, who cares about all that? Are there any real life applications of the prisoner's dilemma? Consider the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. To arm or not to arm, that was the question. As each side pondered this question, they found it strategically preferable to arm rather than to disarm in order to prevent being overpowered and defeated by the other side. So both sides engage in continuous arming only to find themselves overburdened not only by the cause of deadly weapons, but also by the fear for mankind's final war. If they had been able to cooperate and disarm together, then they would have achieved peace at no cost to either camp. Another real life example of the prisoner's dilemma is climate change. For each country alone, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions would bring about immediate economic loss. And yet, if every country maintains its current behavior in a business as usual manner, all countries are eventually to suffer from the climate crisis that ensues. And only by joining hands in a common effort to reduce emissions can we find a way out of this dilemma and protect the long-term interests of all. The applications of prisoner's dilemma are simply numerous, ranging from economics to politics, from evolutionary biology to artificial intelligence, and from sports to romantic relationships. Mathematics, it seems to me, is the art of giving the same name to different things. It is about describing the common properties of complex matters using simple theorems and formulas. And mathematics at times may seem a bit too abstract to have anything to do with reality. But it is precisely because it does not assume the actual characteristics of any specific thing that it can apply to so many things and become one of the propellers of human civilization. DGS girls, Every one of us is going to have a chance to be part of a mathematical effort. In July 2016, Hong Kong will have the pride of hosting the largest and highest level global math competition for secondary school students, the International Mathematical Olympiad, IMO. The brightest young mathematical brains from over 100 countries and regions will compete in Hong Kong, make friends in Hong Kong, travel in Hong Kong, and experience Hong Kong. In fact, one of your schoolmates, Alice Wong, was also a member of the Hong Kong team for this event in the last two years. And Isabella Wu and Dorothy Chang have also represented the Hong Kong team for girls' math competitions. Hong Kong last hosted the IMO in 1994 and we are hosting it again in 2016. I'm very fortunate to be able to shoulder this mission along with math professors and secondary school teachers. But in your hands, DGS girls, more than mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. We will engage many volunteers for the IMO, including student guides for the teams from different countries. And we are also hold, hold, holding the logo design competition for IMO 2016, whose judges include deans of arts or design of four local universities. In all these, I'm sure DGS girls will help display the best of Hong Kong to the world. We all know, we all know that Hong Kong's prosperity is facing unprecedented challenge from our competitors. And multiple studies have alarmed us of our lack of creative technological incentive. So it is my sincere hope that Hong Kong's hosting of the IMO will be able to raise the awareness in mathematics, science, and technology across the community. 
help restructure our economy and broaden our economic structure and stimulate the development of high-value-added, knowledge-intensive industries. But an even deeper meaning of the IMO, I believe, is that it can help unite society. Too much and for too long in our land, we see conquest, but not cooperation. Retaliation, but not compassion. Force, but not wisdom. We see the prisoner's dilemma, but not the trust and courage to solve it. We see everything there is, except that which makes us proud to be the people of Hong Kong. But when a motion to support the IMO was made in the Legislative Council four weeks ago, members of different backgrounds and different representations almost unanimously gave their support to this education endeavor. And the same will be true of the citizens of Hong Kong. Finally, DGS girls, I congratulate you all. Not merely on your promising life journey, but also on your selected role in history. For you and I will have the privilege to serve and lead this wonderful city in what could be the most decisive decades in its history. This city was built by countless brave predecessors, and the decisions and acts that we make in our generation will shape Hong Kong for generations yet unborn. So let us all make an effort, an effort to understand, an effort to respect, an effort to accommodate, and work together to weave a beautiful future for this land of ours. When we do that, history will stand and cheer. Thank you very much.